Let us take a quick examination of some of the methods, the strategy employed by white liberals to harness and exploit the political potential ener energies of the so-called Negro in America. The crooked politicians in Washington, D.C. always make a big noise over the proposed civil rights legislation. By blowing up the civil rights issue, this lends stature to the Negro civil rights leaders. And once the image of these Negro civil rights leaders has been built up way beyond their proper proportion, these same Negro civil rights leaders are then used to influence and control the Negro voters for the benefit of the white politicians who pose as liberals and who pose as the friend of the Negro. The white liberals control the Negroes and the Negro vote by controlling the Negro civil rights leaders. As long as they control the Negro civil rights leaders, they can also control and contain the Negro struggle. They can control the Negro so-called revolt. And I must point out right here, there's no such thing as a Negro revolution. There's a black revolution, but not a Negro revolution. Who ever heard of a nonviolent revolution? Who ever heard of a peaceful revolution? Who ever heard of revolutionaries standing up like chumps with locked arms singing, we shall overcome? Who ever heard of a revolution based on a desegregated lunch counter and a desegregated theater and a desegregated public park and a desegregated toilet, which they call public accommodation? Revolutions are based on land, and they are brought about by the landless against the landlord. The Negro Revolution is controlled by white liberals. That's the Negro Revolution is controlled by white liberals. It's controlled by the government. But the Black Revolution is controlled by God. This man of God cannot be controlled in any way by the white man. And he will not compromise in any way with the wrongs that this government has inflicted upon our people. The Negro Revolt is a backfire. It's controlled by the white man. The Negro revolt is controlled by the government. The leaders of the Negro revolt, the so-called Negro civil rights leaders, are subsidized, influenced, and controlled by white liberals. And all of the demonstrations that are taking place in this country for desegregated lunch counters, theaters, public toilets, are just artificial fires that have been instigated by white liberals and is being called the Negro Revolt in hope that they can use it to fight off the real black revolution that has already swept through Asia and swept through Africa and is getting started in Latin America and is now manifesting itself here in this country. Can we prove what we say? Can we prove that the Negro Revolt is controlled by white liberals? Yes. Right after the Birmingham explosion, right after the police dogs, the police clubs, and the fire hoses last May, the New York Times on May the 15th, on page 26, reported President Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy, two gentlemen whom I'm certain all of you are familiar. After a luncheon with several newspaper editors from the state of Alabama, some of their Democratic colleagues, or I should say Democrat colleagues, the Times reported the president as warning these editors that they must give at least some token gains to the moderate Negro leaders in order to enhance the image of these moderate Negro leaders in the eyesight of the black masses. Otherwise, he warned, the masses of Negroes might turn to the direction of Negro extremists. And he named the black Muslims as being foremost among these Negro extremists. So he tried to get them to build up the image of the moderate Negro leader, 
what he called or termed the responsible Negro leader. And whenever you hear a white man refer to a Negro leader as a responsible Negro leader, he means a Negro leader who's responsible to him. In essence, the president was admitting to these Southern editors that he was trying to build up the weak image of the Negro civil rights leaders in order to offset the, the strong religious image of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He wasn't giving these Negro leaders anything that they deserve, but he was admitting the necessity of building them up and propping them up in order to hold the masses of black people in check, keep them in his grasp and under his control. The president knew that once the Negroes follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, once they're exposed to his doctrine, the white liberal can never influence Negroes or control those Negroes or use those Negroes for the political benefit of white liberals any longer. Dr. Martin Luther King's image had been shattered the previous year when he failed to bring about desegregation in Albany, Georgia. The other uh, Negro civil rights leaders had also become fallen idols. The masses of black people across the country at the local level had begun to lead themselves and to take their cases to the streets on their own. The government in Washington knew that something had to be done to get the Negroes back into the corral back under the control of the white liberal. The government immediately began to put out the propaganda, encouraging Negroes to follow only what it called responsible Negro leadership. And as I said, by responsible Negro leaders, the government actually meant Negro leaders who were responsible to the government and who could therefore be controlled by the government. The government knows that Mr. Muhammad is responsible only to God and can be controlled only by God. <laughs> Last May, right after the police dogs, fire hoses, and police clubs, the Birmingham Negroes exploded. They rioted. They erupted. And during the many long weeks when the police dogs and clubs and water hoses were brutalizing Negro women and Negro children and Negro babies. And the Negroes had, to, had called, Negro leaders had called for a federal inter intervention of troops by the president. The president sat on his hands, saying there was nothing he could do. But when the Negroes erupted in self-defense, the president then sent in federal troops not to defend Negroes, but to defend the whites against whom the Negroes had finally erupted. There are many of you who may get a little indignant at what I say about the president, but it's a matter of record. As long as the dogs were biting black children, as long as the dogs were biting black women, as long as the dogs were biting black babies, and the Negro leaders cried to Washington, D.C. for the intervention of federal troops, the president, one of your fellow city citizens, told them there was no law on the statute books that he could use to intervene. But when black people erupted and started taking the heads of white people, the troops arrived the next morning. <laughs> At that point, all over the country, spontaneous demonstrations began to take place. Negroes began to talk about how they were going to march on Washington and tie up the Senate and tie up the Congress, and tie up the White House, how they were going to lay their bodies across the runaway at the airport and stop the airplanes from taking off or from landing, bring all traffic to a halt. And as much as this president travels by plane, he really would have been in bad shape. <laughs> this frightened the government. It frightened the white power structure in Washington, D.C. The president called in the Negro civil rights leaders and told them to bring this thing to a stop. They had gone far enough. They were deviating from the script. 
But the Negro civil rights leaders told the president they couldn't stop it because they didn't start it. They couldn't bring it to a halt. They weren't even leading it. It's spontaneous. It's at the grassroots level. It's in the hands of the masses. It's in the streets. It has no leadership whatsoever. That was why it was so militant. When the president saw that he couldn't stop it, he joined it. He endorsed it. He welcomed it. He became a part of it. And it was he who put the six Negro civil rights leaders at the head of it. It was he who made them the big six. How did he do it? How did he gain control of the March on Washington? A study of his strategy will give you a glimpse of the political genius of the family that now rules the country from the White House and how they use the Negro to do it. The president endorsed the march that should have been, that should have been the tip off. A few days after he endorsed it, in New York City, at the Carlisle Hotel, a hotel which I think if you investigate, you'll find belongs to that illustrious family. A philanthropic society called the Taconic Foundation, headed by a white man, a white liberal named Stephen Currier, called a meeting of the six civil rights leaders in an effort to bring about unity of action and unity of purpose among all the civil rights groups. These six civil rights groups were shown how they were destroying themselves by divisions and by attacks upon each other. And it was suggested that since most of their divisions stemmed from their competition for funds from white liberals, they should unite their fundraising efforts. If you check the paper, you'll find that right after the Birmingham explosion, Martin Luther King began to run all over the country participating in fundraising rallies. And Roy Wilkins accused him of starting trouble and expecting the NAACP to get him out and pay the bills while they run all over the country and took all the money. And it caused a lot of friction. So this white liberal, they knew it. And they brought these six Negro leaders together and talked to them, told them, don't rock the boat. They formed the Council for United Civil Rights Leadership for fundraising purposes. They chose as chairman of this council the Urban League's Whitney Young and Stephen Currier, the white liberal, as co-chairman. It took this white liberal to bring all the six Negro civil rights groups together. It took this white liberal to unite these six into one group. And then he let them select their own chairman, but he himself became co-chairman, which placed him and the Taconic Foundation in position to exercise influence and control over the civil rights leaders and through them control over the entire civil rights, Negro civil rights movement, plus the March on Washington. According to the New York Times, dated August 4th, 1963, $800,000 was split up between these six Negro civil rights organizations on June the 19th, and another 700,000 was promised after the march. Public relations experts were made available to them immediately. They were given access to the news media across the country, and the press immediately began to project the big six as the leaders of the March on Washington. As soon as they became looked upon in the public eye as being in control of the march, as being leaders of the march, as being the organizers of the march and inseparable from the march image, the, their next step was to invite four white liberals to become a part of the Godhead or group of leaders who would ultimately okay all plans and therefore thereby completely control the march. These four white liberals, Walter Ruther, a Jewish rabbi, a priest, and a 
pastor from Protestants, represented the same factions that had put the president in Washington, D.C. Catholic liberals, Protestant liberals, Jewish liberals, and labor. When the president had learned that he couldn't stop the march, he joined it and got all his friends to join it. This is the way the white liberals took over the march on Washington. This is the way they weakened its impact and changed its course by changing the participants, by changing the contents. They were able to change the very nature of the march itself. An example. If I have a cup of coffee that's too strong for me because it's too black, I weaken it by pouring cream into it. I integrate it with cream. <laughs> if I keep pouring enough cream in the coffee, pretty soon the entire flavor of the coffee is changed. The nature of the coffee is changed. And if enough cream is poured in, Eventually, you don't even know that I have coffee in my cup. This is what happened with the March on Washington. They didn't integrate it. They infiltrated it. <laughs> Whites joined it. They engulfed it. They became so much a part of it, it lost its original fla flavor. It ceased to be a black march. It ceased to be militant. It ceased to be angry. It ceased to be impatient. In fact, it ceased to be a march. It became a farce. It became a picnic, an outing with a festive, circus-like atmosphere, with clowns and all. The government had learned that most of these demonstrations where black people predominate are very militant and oft times lead to violence. But to the same degree that whites participate, violence most times is decreased. I watched a white clergyman on the, t on the TV news in New York when the Negroes were picketing the downstate medical center in Brooklyn. I think the man's name was Potter or Cooper or something, I forget. He's somehow up official in, the, in, in one of these Protestant churches. And they asked him why he was out there picketing, a white man. And he told them on the news, I just came back from Washington talking with the attorney general. And he told me that their statistics had shown that wherever these demonstrations take place and they're predominantly black, they're too militant and too prone toward violence. And they had discovered that when whites participate to the same degree that whites participate, the militancy decreases and violence is eliminated, minimized. So when these whites join these Negroes and they're demonstrating, there's two different motives. The Negroes are demonstrating for freedom, but the whites are out there demonstrating to keep the Negroes from getting too far out of line. The government found out that this is the only way black people could be held in check. The government told the marchers on Washington what time to arrive in Washington, where to arrive, and when to arrive. Then the government channeled them from the arrival point to the feet of a dead president named Washington and let them march from there to the feet of another dead president named Lincoln. <laughs> the original black militants had planned to march on the White House, on the Senate, on the Congress, but the shrewd politicians in Washington, D.C., realizing that these black militants could not be stopped, joined them, and thereby these white liberals were able to lead them away from the White House, away from the Capitol, away from the Senate, and away from the Congress, and away from victory by keeping them marching between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Monument, marching between the feet of two dead men. The march was controlled by the president. The government told the marchers what signs to carry, what songs to sing, what speeches they could make and what speeches they could not make. And then the government told them 
to be sure and get out of town by sundown. <laughs> and all those Negro Uncle Toms were out of town by sundown. One of the six Negro leaders, John Lewis, chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was stopped from making a militant speech. The speech was censored by the Reverend Patrick O'Boyle, the Catholic Archbishop of Washington, D.C. Catholic clergyman doesn't speak on his own. He doesn't have that latitude. When he opens up his mouth, that's the church speaking. This was a case in which the Catholic Church itself, for whom Reverend O'Boyle speaks, put itself in a position of censoring one of the six Negro civil rights leaders. This shows John F. Kennedy's shrewd strategy. In fact, that's what that F stands for, the fox. <laughs> This Catholic, Catholic president placed the Catholic bishop in a, in a position to exercise censorship over any one of the six Negro civil rights leaders who tried to deviate from the script in that great performance or show that the government itself had controlled from the very beginning. So in the final analysis of the march, it would have to be classified as the best performance of the year. In fact, the best performance of the century. It topped anything that Hollywood could have produced. And if we were going to give out Academy Awards in 1963, we would have to nominate John the Fox. Uh, for an Oscar for the producer of the year. And to the four white liberals also goes an Oscar for, for the best actors. They really acted like sincere liberals and fooled many Negroes. And to the six Negro civil rights leaders also should go an Oscar for the best supporting cast. <laughs> They lent their support to what they knew was nothing but an act, nothing but a show, nothing but a farce. Now that the show is over, the black masses are still without jobs, still without homes, and still without land. Their Christian churches are being bombed. Their little girls are being murdered. What did the march accomplish? The president has a bigger image as a liberal, the four whites have a bigger image as a liberal. The six Negroes have bigger images as leaders. But the black masses are still unemployed, still in the slums, are still hungry. And I might add, they're getting angrier and more explosive every day. So in my conclusion, because of America's evil deeds, and tricks and false promises against the so-called Negroes in this country, like Egypt and Babylon before her, America herself now stands before the bar of justice. America is now facing her day of judgment. And she can't escape because God himself is the judge. God himself is now the administrator of justice. And God himself is going to be the divine executor. Is it possible for America to escape this divine disaster? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that if America can't atone for the crimes that she has committed against 20 million so-called Negroes, if she can't undo the evils she has brutally and mercilessly heaped upon our people these past 400 years, then America has already signed her own doom. 
And our people here would be foolish to accept America's deceitful offers of integration at this late date into a doomed society. How can America atone for these crimes? I must point out, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has already said, a desegregated theater or lunch counter won't solve the problem. Better jobs won't solve the problem. An integrated cup of coffee isn't sufficient pay for 400 years of slave labor. A better job in the white man's factory or business is at best only a temporary solution. The only lasting or permanent solution is complete separation on some land that we can call our own. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says the race problem can be solved forever just by sending the 20 million ex-slaves back to our own homeland where we can then live in peace and harmony among our own people. But this government should provide the transportation plus everything else we need to get started again in our own country. This government should give us everything we need in the form of machinery, tools, material, and finance, enough to last us from 20 to 25 years until we can become an independent people in our own right. And it's good that you've lived long enough to have some laughter left in you. If the American government is afraid to send us back to our own country, to our own people, then America must set aside some separate territory here in the Western Hemisphere, where the two races can live apart from each other, since we certainly don't get along peacefully when we're together. The size of the territory can be judged or determined according to our own population. If we number one-seventh of the population, give us one-seventh of the land. That's our share. It must not be in the desert, but where there is plenty of rain and mineral wealth. We want fertile, productive land on which we can farm and provide our own people with food, clothing, and shelter. This government must supply the machinery and the other tools needed for us to dig the earth. Give us everything we need that will take care of us for 20 to 25 years until we can produce and supply our own needs. So in my conclusion, I repeat, we want no part of integration with this wicked race that enslaved us. We want complete separation from this wicked race. But we should not be expected to leave America empty-handed. After 400 years of slave labor, we have some back pay coming, a bill that is owed that must be collected. If the government of America truly repents of its sins against our people and truly atones by giving us our true share, then America can save herself. But if America waits for God to step in, and force her into a just settlement. God will take this entire continent away from America. For as the Bible says, God can give the entire kingdom to whomsoever he will, which only means God can give this entire continent to whomsoever he will. Thank you.